Good morning, everyone. And hey, before I get started today, uh, today is my birthday. So happy birthday to me in quarantine and happy weekend to you, wherever it is you may be. So today is a weekend review. I'm gonna post a quick video, goes over all the objectives you went through this week so that you can see the patterns overall instead of zooming in on any one particular day's difficult topic. So here's what I'm picturing overall in my head. When I'm thinking of this unit, I'm thinking of lenses and next week, mirrors. But we really need a good understanding of lenses in order to do mirrors because you'll see on Monday, they're the same thing. They work almost precisely the same. So here's what you worked on this week. We worked on convex converging lenses as well as concave diverging lenses. These are the two main ones you need to know. So when we describe these, this is a convex shape. You might see it called biconvex shape whereas this one is concave. You'll hear me just call this concave. And both of these shapes represent lenses that use refraction. And when they use refraction, they cause light that goes through them to bend. A convex lens and a concave lens both cause parallel rays of light to go straight through the vertex. Vertex is this spot right in the middle of your lens. But any ray that goes parallel above or below the vertex gets um, changed in their path because of the lens. So a convex lens does converging behavior. It causes those rays of light to converge on a single focal point. Now the focal point is positive because that ray or this type shape of lens causes the light to converge. So converging means that the shape has a positive focal length. Whereas diverging behavior diverges light away from a virtual focal point. So it has a negative focal length. So let's say this is my negative focal point. It's back here on the virtual side of the lens. This causes the light to diverge away from it. And this is because of refraction. Now, a thing you might have noticed in my drawing here is I'm not drawing any behavior towards the edge of the lens. I'm choosing this vertical line right in between to be the place where the lens changes the path. So I don't have to deal with the squiggly stuff that goes on inside the lens itself. It's an approximation, okay? Now, then we started drawing ray diagrams. And to be fair, Ray diagrams can be um, a little bit difficult to do virtually because you guys are at home and you're not probably not taking out rulers and doing stuff. So I'm gonna show you how I draw ray diagrams, okay? So for converging, ray number one goes parallel into the lens and then it converges towards the focal point. I'm gonna call this ray number one. Ray number one, diverges away from the focal point. If it's a diverging lens, okay? Now, let's say I have an actual uh, ray diagram scenario that I wanna draw out here. I'm gonna use that to draw ray number one on here. So, ray number one would leave the top of the A, go parallel in, hit the center of the lens, and converge towards the focal point. I is still over on this side. That B would go towards here and diverge away. Okay. So that's how we draw ray one. And please note that ray one comes from the fact whoop, that convex is converging and concave is diverging. Ray number two, I'm gonna draw it in blue. Ray number two represents the ray that goes through the vertex. Any ray that goes through the vertex of a lens keeps going in a straight line undeterred. So ray number two is this ray, all right? Ray number two is this one. 
But when I draw ray number two on an actual ray diagram, it goes from the top of the letter A through the vertex, and then it just keeps going in a straight line. Do, 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 do. Oh, I need a ruler of some sort. Ray two leaves the top of the object, goes through the vertex, and goes undeterred in a straight line. So from B, top of the object through the vertex. And now I actually already have enough information to determine the type of image I see. Remember, both rays left the top of my letter. So the top of the letter A is here, and the feet of the letter A stay on the principal axis. And now that I have that, I can really easily see that my image that's formed by the intersection of these two rays is real, okay, Up, uh, inverted, and larger. Now, how do I know it's real? It's real because those blue and red rays literally intersect each other. If they literally intersect, real. They're inverted because the A is upside down from the original, and it is most definitely larger. So you should be able to draw and interpret this ray diagram. Okay, let's look at B, the concave lens. Rays leave from the top of the object, but hey, me with my brain over here on this side and my eyes, look at me looking at this thing, um, <laughs> it sees ray one and two and it thinks to itself, well, light travels in a straight line. Even though rays one and two don't literally meet up in real life, what if they came from back here? This is a virtual image because rays one and two didn't actually intersect with each other in real life. My brain just thinks that it did, okay? So that's the top of the letter B, and my image of the letter B is upright. It's still the capital letter B. It is virtual because those rays didn't actually intersect, and it is definitely smaller than the original. So what you should be able to do with lenses is draw ray diagrams, but since we probably won't be able to get you to draw them on the test, be able to interpret them. And rays one and two are the most important for you to know, though I suppose if you want to be thorough. So let's say I have light that goes backwards through the focal point would come out parallel. So light that goes through the focal point would come out parallel. But since that intersects in the same place anyways, two rays are sufficient to determine the location of your image. Similarly for this one, it would go towards that focal point, the far focal point, and out parallel. Ray three is generally one that we won't draw um, just because if rays one and two can solve it, why do ray three? Okay. But being fully aware that it is difficult to do ray diagrams sometimes, especially from home, well, we could also do some math with it. All right, and this is where some people had some questions for me at my office hours on Friday. So, the four equations you should have mathematically. The first is the lens maker's equation. This one is good for relating the focal length to the object and image distance. And sometimes you'll see me write this as DO and DI or DI and DO, it doesn't actually matter. We know that the radius of curvature is twice as large as the focal length. And if you're having trouble picturing that one, a good picture to have in the back of your head is imagine that a convex lens is literally just the intersection of two spheres. This is my convex lens. So the center of curvature would be the points here. The radius of curvature would be this would be radius is a distance, center of curvature is a point, and then the focal points where it would converge to light is half of a radius. So maybe, oh, if this is the principal axis, my focal point is like here, half the radius, okay? So then we have two magnifications equations. We have the definition of magnification that it's image height over object height, or 
we can use negative di over do. Image distance to object distance. So just to review, I'll show you one problem and how we can interpret things with it. Um, and since I've only got time for one problem, I'm going to do the absolute hardest problem. And once you guys see that, that the hardest problem is tackleable, approachable using these methods, then you'll, it'll work out, right? Then you'll have seen the hardest it can possibly be. And let's go with the hardest it can possibly be. Um, I'm going to use a diverging lens. Okay. Let's say I have a situation where I want to take a picture and I'm going to take maybe a flower smaller than a tree. Flower. And I know I'm given at the beginning of the problem that the radius of curvature is 10 centimeters. So I don't know the focal length. I know the flower is, yeah, eight centimeters away should work, All right? I don't know where the image is gonna show up. Our original flower is 20 centimeters tall. So yeah, sorry, I'm not drawing to scale here, but it is close enough. Is 10 centimeters. Let's say I imagine this is a whole big sphere here. The center of curvature would be around here-ish. So the focal point would be half of that. And so I'm going to use this r is equal to 2f equation to find f. Okay, so part one of the problem, r is equal to 2f. Therefore, if r is equal to 10, then the focal length is 5 centimeters. But here's why I said we would start with the trickiest problem. Guys, this is a diverging device. Every single diverging device, no matter what, if it diverges the light, has a negative focal length. So even though this equation comes out to positive 5, you need to remember, and sometimes I'm nice and tell you, you need to remember that focal length of a diverging device is negative, right? Because it's actually not this circle and this center of curvature and that focal point that I've drawn there that matter actually the one that's on the negative side. So if this is my negative f, that's the one light diverges away from. Okay, so next, let's see. Um, let's find the di. Where does the image show up? Now, if you want to go with uh, the ray diagram method, just to double check your work, ray one would go parallel in and away from this focal point. Ray two would go from the top of the flower through the vertex, causing the eye to see some sort of virtual smaller upright flower over here. So I'm gonna use that to check my work. I'm expecting di to be less than five and to be negative because it's on this virtual side as opposed to the real side, right? Where those real light rays are is the real side. Okay, so let's lens makers equation this out. Um, a thing to be careful about here is that negatives and positives do matter. You can't just cancel the ones either. You have to least common denominator everything in order to be able to solve this correctly, just like you would for um, parallel circuits, okay? So least common denominator of 5 and 8, I'm going to go with 40. So that's negative 8 fortieths is equal to 1 over di plus 5 fortieths. I'm going to subtract 5 fortieths to the left. That's negative 8 fortieths minus 5 fortieths equals 1 over di. Or 1 over di is equal to negative 13, so that's 8 and 5 over 40. And let's cross multiply this out so we can solve it. That's 40 equals negative 13 di. di is equal to negative 40 divided by 13 is equal to negative 3. Just about 3.07 centimeters. We'll call it negative 3. 
But can we check? Does that make sense? If this is negative five centimeters, yeah, that totally makes sense that that's negative three. That makes sense. Plus, let's be clear on what these numbers mean. Negative in this case, negative di means virtual image. And that's exactly what we have. So glad that all worked out. All right, let's keep going. We found some of the values. We found f, we found di. In order to find hi, I'm going to find m, the magnification. Magnification can be found by taking negative di over dl. Or in this case, negative negative 3 over 8. So negatives cancel negatives. That's cool. This gives me a magnification of positive 0 0.38. And what do these numbers mean? Well, positive for magnification means upright. And this number has a magnitude of less than 1. Since this number is less than 1, this means the image appears smaller than the original. And virtual, smaller, upright is exactly what the ray drawing uh, depicts. So finally, how big does the image of the flower look? Well, it looks 38% of the height of the original object. So last equation. This method has taken us through all four of the equations you need to know. We've got 0 0.38 is equal to hi over 20. And think of this as you're taking 38% of 20. So this appears 7.7 .7 centimeters tall. HI is positive because it is upright. It's going above the axis. My flower looks seven centimeters tall instead of 20 centimeters tall. Okay? So that's everything we did last week. Let's review. You should know that lenses use refraction to bend the light. And it has one of two behaviors. Light that goes in parallel goes through the focal point or away from the focal point. Light that goes through the vertex keeps going undeterred. That means if I'm doing ray diagrams, light that goes towards the focal point or away from the focal point, and a ray that goes straight from the top of the object through the vertex can be used to predict the location, size, and characteristics of images. Wherever those two lines meet, whether they meet in real life, forming a real and inverted image, or they meet back where your brain thinks they do, forming a virtual upright image, we can use ray diagrams as one method to classify images. Because right? while you could just go memorize all the types of images that are formed, that would take a long time. Ray diagrams is one method to be able to predict and classify the images formed. Or mathematically, these four equations could be used to predict and classify the images formed if you had enough numerical information. Oh, but before you go, someone asked me to post a unit map for this unit so you can follow along to where you are. Um, this week, we've done all of lenses. You should know to be able to draw ray one and two for converging and diverging lenses. And please note that right next to it with mirrors, we're following literally the same type of pattern. <laughs> Equations, same z's, um, with a singular difference that instead of drawing ray two, going from the top of your object through the vertex, ray two goes from the top of your object through the center of curvature and bounces back, all right? So we'll deal with these more on Monday. But here's pacing for unit. We did a whole week on lenses, so we front-loaded all the different types of images, all the equations, all the ray diagrams. We're going to repeat with mirrors, but we'll go much faster because we've already done all the groundwork in lenses. We'll work on a special case of optics with the eye and how the different muscles, like your iris, pull in your eye in order to make images show up on your retina. We'll learn about polarized delight, which is 
my jam because polarized light is super cool. Uh, it allows some animals to detect predators, uh, but you and I can't see it. So I'll show you a workaround with that. And then color. Why is it that sometimes I can make objects that are yellow, like this duck here, look red? Best of luck, guys. Have a great weekend. And happy birthday to me.